Greetings, dear ones. I am Cryon of Magnetic Service. And there would be those who would say the transition is too smooth. That it's the man pretending in the chair yet again for his group. And if that is what you think, dear human being, then that is what you think. And there is nothing here in the room that is going to push and pull or persuade. For the human being and their free choice is honored above all things. There are many ways to discover the divinity inside. One of them is this way. By understanding that these messages could be significant, they come from the other side of the veil. They are angelic. If you can even define that. If you were to ask human beings if they would believe in a higher source, they would say yes. If you ask a human being what form that would take, they would be varied in their answers. And some of them would say that channeling is appropriate and some would say it is not. And the ones who would say it is not, however, would go into the forest and take the hand of a tree and feel God inside. And there is no difference. Blessed is the human being who finds their divinity and the solace and the peace that they need in any way that suits them. And so it is not something that is presented for belief or for enjoyment. It is here to soothe that which needs to be soothed, to instruct that which needs to be instructed, to shake hands with a countenance that is divine within you. That is the purpose of the channeling of Kryon, of sitting in the chair. And before we begin the 11 questions, I have only one thing to say. There is a connection between what you see outside and what you have inside. And perhaps that will be one of the questions. For I already know what is formulating in the consciousness of the potentials of the eleven who sit in the chair. It is not mind reading. For there is part of you which is an entangled state with all that is to say all is known. Not what you're going to do but the potentials of what you might based upon what is happening in your life, based upon what it is you bring to the table, as he say. We know the issues of the moment. And every single one of you who sits in the chair, you are not a mystery to us. There's great love for every puzzle that sits in the chair. <laughs> First question, please. When you spoke of when we see outside is what we see inside, that has to do with my question. When I was sitting on the Grand Canyon wall this morning looking out, I started crying and saying, feeling I'm with my people. And I also live in Mount Shasta where heaven and earth truly meet and I'm with my people there. But what I have challenges with, cry on, is when I go into the world in the big cities and the electromagnetic frequencies don't resonate with me there. and I feel as if I walk in two worlds and I don't want to leave here or Mount Shasta. Tell me how to walk in those other places. The human countenance is learning. And the biggest issue is learning to be more like your partner who is Gaia. If you take a look at that which you gaze upon, which is the trees, the rocks, and all those things that you find to be glamorous in a way that is ageless and is beautiful, you feel peace, do you not? What are you pouring into the air, human beings? And 
what are you polluting the ocean with human beings let me ask you this is Gaia anxious no no there is something there that Gaia knows and has figured out a great a great long time ago and that is what you are to learn number one the human beings must go through gyrations of mistakes in order to find solutions number two that there is an evolutionary process at hand of consciousness which we will talk about even more on what you would call Friday night and this evolutionary consciousness shift is a promise that human beings are changing and part of what they are changing is exactly what irritates you there is going to be a revolution of common sense it's going to happen slowly the revolution of common sense means that there will be an alliance with Gaia that will echo the ancients you look out upon the canyon as the ancients did let me ask you this what is the first ceremony attribute of any of the indigenous on the planet and let me tell you what they are number one to honor Gaia and number two to honor the ancestors you are your own ancestor dear one because you are an old soul on the planet you are an old soul and so the old soul in you is disturbed by what you would call new invention by things that would seem insulting to that which you know is precious know this these things are in progress of change so here is my advice to you be more like Gaia smile when you see these things and know that there'll come a day when they won't be that way that is what your instructions are be at peace with these things change what you can in yourself and let others see your change so they will see how precious and beautiful it is question two Hello, Graham. It's so wonderful to speak with you finally after listening to you for six years. In 2006, I received um, a partial translation of um, works you had done that described the purpose of the lighthouse and how the lighthouse is to embody the light and that by doing so, those in the darkness are looking for it. At the beginning of this year, I experienced that change. But I have been going through that process for quite some time, but it anchored into me. My question is, is that the more light I'm anchoring into myself and the more alignment that I'm becoming into, the more separated I start to feel from those around me my family and my friends and I find myself crying a lot because I have to let go and that's hard so my question is is that how do I better integrate that how, do, how does anyone integrate that change when you're moving into your soul's purpose but leaving everyone else behind another question from an old soul and it's a good one how do I answer this that will please you I cannot first of all let us speak of you the integration that you have described that is what you have described and has been more recent than before is all accurate and true and the events of your life to create it are on purpose and you find yourself in a strange position you have family and friends who are starting to look at you differently and you know that and they wonder about you 
the masters who walked the earth, how do you think their families felt when they started being awed? <laughs> you're not going to like the answer in one respect and you're going to love it in another. And I will tell you this, dear ones, those who do not wish to be with you because you are of not like mind with him, you are going to have to love them and let them go. There's nothing you can do to bring them into an enlightened fold if they do not choose to go there. Now here's the good news. Nothing is going to happen to them because they're not accepting you. There is no judgment. And the only reason that you sit and ask the question is because you are sad for you. <laughs> and you know that. And how can we change that? For they're all right. They're the same as they always were. It is you who are shifting and finding that which is different from what they want. This is the good news. And there are dozens in this room who are ready to be your family. And they will fill the space that empties itself in your heart from those who are retreating from you. Believe me, if you let them, this new family of God is related to you also. I want you to accept this and be peaceful with it and know that it is appropriate and it's time. Next question. I was wondering if you could shed some light on the relationship between information and consciousness. Information lays there static, like words on a page. Even the most profound information I could give you now about who you are, how things work, who your seed biology, what the trees have seen. The information that I could give you about how the canyon formed, which I've done from this spot, just lays there on the page, seemingly. It does nothing. Consciousness is the bowl of active participation of information. It's when you take the information and empty it into the bowl of consciousness is when you get the magic called discernment. The discernment engine is partly biological. That means there's intellect involved and mostly emotional and spiritual, which means there is another part involved, which we will call innate. A cauldron, a mixture, a soup of analyzing the information. Now when they come together perfectly, then when you read the words or hear it, it's instant understanding. Let me tell you the difference. Right now, no matter what I say, it's received in many different ways from this group, depending upon who they are, the depth of their wisdom, their old souls, their akash, why they're here, what they're ready for, whether they're in transition or not, or whether they have had things settle for them and they're peaceful. They will receive the information differently. Some of those in the audience right now receive the information and they discern it instantly and it goes into their consciousness and becomes part of them. So the information therefore has a confluence of energy. And they would say the information is energy. There are others who will look at the information, not deal with it at all, and it's just words on the page. And to them, it has no active element. You see the difference. So the real difference between information and consciousness is what you do with it. Are you ready to hear understand and discern in real time. If you are, dear ones, you've captured enough light so that this process is yours. We encourage that process, for this is the process of the future. Oh, by the way, 
most of the children of the planet already have it. <laughs> you can't look at them and tell them a non-truth or give them a little white lie or any of the other things that adults do so easily in the past where they'll look at you and they'll know better. Next question. Hello, Cryon. What is it that you would like the people of New Zealand to know about the part we have to play in this world? Thank you. New Zealand faces an issue at the moment. There are so many things wrong there, as you know. And the, the thing that rings so wrong, how could you be such an important piece of Lemuria and have things going so difficult? Top to bottom, there are problems with environmental control. <laughs> not doing it right and you know that problems with the economy worse than most people even know there's more there's so much more I would like to tell you this precious place is in the process of recalibration it has to be for what's going to happen there next is going to take two generations dear one there are old souls in New Zealand I would like to talk to you right now if you want to take a message you've got to hold a light don't move away go to where the ground does not shake dear because there's going to be more shaking where it did before and it won't be that far away this whole country, this island nation, such an important part of the earth, spiritually, has to go through a recalibration, a revolution of consciousness in order to come out of the slump that has been given to it and had put into it by itself. There come a day when you're not the little sister to the continent next to you where they're going to come want to see you because you have spiritual attributes healing success it will happen that is the answer to your question hold a light where you are anyone you know who is there we need light let the old souls remain where they are it's not easy next question Greetings, Crayon. Thank you for your love. You have mentioned several times in sessions like this one that all light workers present will be reincarnating. Uh, my question is, is it possible to work towards not reincarnating anymore in a dimension like this? And if not, what happens with the work that Eastern spirituality has been doing for several thousand years about being liberated from the chain of birth and death. Thank you. Let us make some definitions. There are several kinds of death. You are told, perhaps, by elders that death is wrong and is bad and you don't want it. That is not what we see. For death is rejuvenation. That is what we see. Ask an old soul in here how many times they've been to the earth. And if you could talk to the innate of the old soul, they would say, death has no sting. The worst part of death is the sorrow of those left behind. The one who goes through death, I would like to tell you, that soul is celebrating it. <laughs> They come back with a new body. They carry in their akash everything they ever learned. Old soul, did you know that? They come back enhanced past any lifetime they've ever had. In the birth-death cycle, that is a celebration. 
Now what happens if when you die and you have nothing? Misery. No enlightenment. Perhaps you're at a, a place in a country in a civilization where it's been tough and hard and you're dying young. And now you're going to go back and do it again. Birth and death and birth and death. And that's a different cycle, isn't it? What old soul wants to be released from rejuvenation? Most will say, no. Now granted, I know who is here, and in the human mind, I know what you're thinking. You're tired. And if I would say to you, are you looking forward to coming back, you would say, no. I'm done. I know that. Because this is the human being in their 3D-ness who gets tired and doesn't want to think about going through it again. What if I told you, dear one, you're going to come back, you're going to have a young body, you're going to awaken with enlightenment. That you're going to have a common sense factor that is beyond anything that you ever had as an old soul and you're going to start where you left off and keep going with youth. As that sounds so bad. And you're going to continue what you came for. That's not a cycle to be released from. So, dear one, there is no release from that cycle. There is only an enhancement of your understanding of what cycle you are in. I know what cycle you are in. And it's time for you to think differently about it. I want you to look forward to what comes next. Humanity is starting to become more enlightened, and that is to say, there'll come a time when even the furthest tribes and the furthest parts of the earth will have fresh water, and they won't have disease. They'll have time for introspection. Their leaders will have more integrity. This time is not that far away. The poverty of the planet will change. The things that you see today which are unconscionable and make you cry will start to shift. Humans are going to figure out why there are so many humans and stop it. <laughs> Question crying gets answered all the, ask all the time is what are we going to do about population explosion and the answer is you know very well what to do. <laughs> and already there are societies that will have plenty of new children but they have zero growth. Or they figured it out. <laughs> they figured it out. That requires the human being become smarter and wiser. And dear one, that's going to happen. So the answer to this is there is no, there is no cycle to be released from when it comes to the cycle of light. Mm. Next question. Hello, Kriam. You've always taught us uh, of our connection to Gaia, and recently you've, you've shared with us how Gaia has been here for possibly four billion years, getting ready for the existence of human beings on the planet, and we've been here for the very last moment of existence. And I know there's been a plan in place to let Gaia evolve over that time to prepare for us. And I was wondering if you can share with us some of those experiences, including specifically the, uh, the days of dinosaurs and the evolution of the planet up to this point and how it prepared us, uh, Gaia, for us at this time. Let me answer that quickly. <laughs> if you look at this logically, and I'm speaking logically, with the intellect and you study Earth's history, it doesn't make sense that you would have mammals of the size and the complexity millions of years ago and no human beings. It's almost like there was a hand that said not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet, and you'd be right. Someday the anthropologists will calculate the odds against what happened. 
And you will see it manifested in the math, the P factor. <laughs> and then you'll know something was happening now. The anthropologists will back this up. The biologists know what I'm going to tell you now. Life had five starts and failed four times. It took thousands of years. That's just life. <laughs> In other words, there was a hand holding back everything. Five starts. The fifth one only got it right because there was the evolution of something called photosynthesis. There is evidence of the four other starts for you to look at and see. There is a plan. And so what I can say to you that is the short answer is everywhere science will look they're going to discover something that they did not expect and that is say that there is no evolutionary common sense to the evolvement of the human being you should have been here a million years ago and you weren't and I will tell you more about that on Friday as well next question hi Kryon Ever since I was young, I've had a number of near-death experiences. Since then, I have studied um, with different people who also have had near-death experiences. The thing is, each one of them had a different reason why a person goes through a near-death experience. And I was wondering if you could talk about near-death experiences and if what really is behind a veil. Thank you. When you were young, <laughs> you are young. <laughs> I mean, in this body, in oh, this lifetime. I see. <laughs> this is complicated, and there are many reasons for what you would call near death experiences. But let me tell you about one attribute for the light worker near death experience. Now, this will be one who is involved in what you would call the metaphysics beyond the physics. This is one who is deeply involved in perhaps spiritual work and then will have a near-death experience and I will tell you what it is. It is that karmic marker which had you die. <laughs> one of the things that happens with a lighthouse, with one who is starting to assume that which is the study of their own mastery and divinity, is that they change their karma. In fact, karma is an old energy system that keeps you learning on the planet. When you reached a certain point, not that long ago, when you started getting into the precession of the equinoxes, the 36 year window of which you are now in the middle of called 2012, things started to shift. When I arrived through my partner in 1987 and then on through 89 in that two year period, I told you you could drop your karma. When you drop your karma, that means that the markers of possibility and propensity don't carry the weight that they used to, but they're still there as potentials. The sickness that almost kills you, the automobile accident that you almost recover from and then finally do, the near-death experience which is accompanied with it, is your death that might have occurred had you not awakened. Do you understand? Now, this is a revelation for three of you in the audience. I know what's going on here. Yes. Yes, you saved your life. For the old karmic markers, if you don't do anything about them, the propensities will march right to the place and fulfill themselves. This is the human being who is not manifesting their own reality. It's the human being who floats with whatever is there and never wakes up to the opportunities that we teach about that is my job. Mastery is yours if you choose, including not only passing the marker of death, but rejuvenating your body far faster than you ever think possible and lasting a long time on this planet. Next question. 
Hi, Krayon. What can you tell us about new human race which was designed recently? The new human race. The seeds are sitting in front of me. <laughs> Don't you understand that? Do you not understand your lineage? Let me tell you something that the ancestors would love to tell you. First of all, you have their face. <laughs> if you see a group of indigenous honoring the elders which have passed, I would like to tell you what they're doing. They're honoring the wisdom of themselves. That it can be passed. Why would they honor elders which are gone that had wisdom which is then gone? It isn't gone. Why isn't it gone? Because the ones who are doing the honoring have received it, not just through the stories. But it passes the mantle, this is scriptural, the mantle of energy that belongs to the elder who was wise on death passes to the one in turn who then receives it at an innate level. That's a Kaushik inheritance. The new human race is you. Less than one half of one percent of the humans on the planet now have to plant these seeds of passionate compassion, of, of one who is tolerant in all situations, who sees the glory of Gaia and feels that which is divine, which is slow to anger and will never send their children to war. This is the new human race. And the seeds are here. You are not only your ancestors. Akashic inheritance will create the future. Who are you going to be, dear one? And I sit here in a timeless state with the potentials of who is going to be. I can see the countries that are going to arise, not because I can tell the fortune, but because I can see the propensities and the potentials working. And I can tell you that who you're going to be is going to be profound. There'll come a day when you look back. And these days you'll call the age of barbarism. You think you're in a modern society? You're not. Ask a Pleiadian what they went through. And they'll tell you you're right on track. And they'll also tell you what's next. And it's not that bad. <laughs> For 20 years, in the face of horror, bad news, doom and gloom, predictions, suffering, I have given you news that flies in the face of all of it. And I will tell you, all you have to do is look back 50 or 60 years to the way the earth used to be in compared to today. You didn't have your next world war that you should have had. There's all manner of things that you're putting together instead of tearing apart, but you don't live long enough to feel it. Only history will show you I'm right. Already I'm right. Give another 50 and you really see it. That's the answer. It's you. Another question? Karen, um, it's been a while since you talk about the Jews and about Israel and the Middle East. Um, uh, what information uh, you would like to share with us? What potential you can see? Again, ask, please. <laughs> I'm asking about the Jews and about Israel. Uh, it's been a while since you <laughs> talk about that. And it's an open question. Oh. I would, ask, I would ask you even to ask it a third time because that's biblical, but I won't put you through it. <laughs> Is this not the crux of everything? 
Did I not say 20 years ago? As go the Jews, go earth. And I will give you the answer yet again. The joke was the repeat. If I'd had you do it three times, there's the energy of a catalyst from an Israeli asking about his own. The Jews will not be able to put this together, dear one. And you know that. And neither will the West. And you know that. What's going to happen in the Middle East eventually, as we see it, and the potentials are already rolling for it, is that it will be done from an Islamic country. Whose young people will rise up and decide that they wish to clean up the Middle East, and they're going to start by not believing what their parents had told them. And they're going to stop hating just because they're told to hate or what happened a hundred years ago or a thousand or even two thousand and they're going to hold out their hand in a way that Israel cannot say no <laughs> Middle Easterners with Middle Easterners former enemies looking at each other in the eye all under 40 that's what we see It's against all odds, it's against everything that's happening, against everything that your news will tell you, or anybody in your country, or your leadership. My partner asked me, he said, will I be here to see it? And I said, of course. And he was smiling so happy, until I told him he'd be another race. <laughs> How long is it going to take? Longer than you want. It's generational. When you walked in the desert, what was the message? For 40 years you walked in the desert, what was the message? Israeli? You know what it was? You can't take the consciousness of slaves and put them in the promised land. So what had to happen? They had to die out. <laughs> You may have a whole generation that's needed for those who would teach what your parents told you to disappear. And tell those like you who would tell your children to be tolerant and not teach them the ugly history facts. It's going to take a while. But I'll tell you this. I see the potentials and it is in progress. Thank you. Is there another? <laughs> Hello, Cryon. Hello. You have told us that the Lemurian Choir will create a planetary shift in December. I'd like to know what kind of planetary shift and how it will occur. <laughs> 1987, you had the harmonic convergence. What did you feel? good for a day? You just celebrate it for a day? 11-11 significant, very significant. And then did you go home and when you arrived everything was different? <laughs> no. Now from then to today, have you seen any changes? It took a while for you to say yes, because the time needed to go by. You have the same thing in the Lemurian signal. It's an activation marker. And it does many things, some of them not to be disclosed until 21 December. And I'll be there to disclose them. <laughs> But I've already told you, it's a two-way signal. Number one, you've said we arrived and we made it. 
we're starting to put things together instead of tearing them apart we see the evolution of consciousness we're starting to understand that we have a spiritual complement even in your religions it is acknowledged that you are part of God you don't have to be that which is new age Christ himself one of the masters one of the masters said I am the son of God and so are you when Muhammad walked into the cave and met the angel the only reason he could talk to the angel face to face without vanishing and burning up is because they had an alliance there was divinity in both of them <laughs> every master Moses talked to the burning bush I wish you'd stop calling it a burning bush it had a name it was angelic that's what interdimensional energy looks like to a human being a seeming fire that does not consume itself it was an angelic entity named cryon did you know that I've been here in a long time and the master he was and what he did set the mold for the ones to follow and the ones before so what am I saying time so the marker will be set energies will be exchanged that will then change what we would call the formula for what comes next 18 more years you have of this alignment to plant seeds like a farmer plants them at the right season before that comes which he knows let them grow that's what you're doing that's what you're doing now that carried an 11 energy all over it and yet you were 10 how did that happen I think you wanted to sit in the last chair <laughs> number 11 question please it's interesting I see you as number 10 my question would be one thing but I've decided I want to ask a different one hmm. how odd we are told to speak in conscious language and say what we mean when we speak it. But so many of us are still learning how. Is there an easy or a shortcut to do this? <laughs> I'm impatient. I'm going to tell you why you're number 10. Ten in numerological terms is a one. There's new beginnings in your life. It's already it's it's already starting. I think you understand what I'm saying, dear. I don't know if you're aware of it. And you're asking questions that are important. How do you how do you carry around <laughs> mastery when everybody around you is an idiot? <laughs> They're not, but this is how it seems. When you walk into old energy and you see mistakes and mistakes and mistakes. When you wish to speak a truth and not sound like you're scolding or that you know better or that you're something and they're not. So what would that language be? It's a concept. I want you to speak compassion in your life. Only compassion. Every time you open your mouth. I want you to think compassionately. There's a new beginning going on with you. I think you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Number 10. <laughs> and this is the compassionate language we want all in this room to know about. 
Before you open your mouth around those who are not believers, what do you see? Do you see that what they're doing perhaps is going to sow the seeds of their own demise? Or you want to cry because of the foolishness there? Or the energy just doesn't suit an answer? You solve it by the language of compassion. Sometimes there's nothing to say. And so be quiet. That is a language too. And sometimes out of your mouth will come loving things that will not offend. They will know, they'll know you're safe to talk to. And that's the key. So that they'll always feel that they can come to you. And some of them will because of what's going on in your life. And so it is in the time we've had together that we have sowed some seeds and given some information and even had some fun. I want you to know this in closing and in passing that's critical. You cannot have the love of God and compassion in your heart and walk around depressed. <laughs> when you walk out of the building and you see the majesty of Gaia, it yells at you that you are part of the system and it is honoring you. Like you look at the trees, it looks at you and says, welcome back. Now let's make a difference together. And so it is.